Uh, Greetings again, brothers and sisters, and welcome to Hardcore Truth, where we are bringing the light of truth into the darkness of the compromise and apostasy of our day. Our goal here at Pathfinders is to find and feed the hungry, find and give drink to the thirsty, because we believe with all of our hearts that there is yet a very small remnant of people who love truth in these last days. Remember, Jesus is coming for those who love truth. So, It's really important to love truth. And after all, truth is a person that is reflected in his word, the word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hardcore is a ministry of Pathfinders Ministries. It's led by myself, Bob Lubeck. And if you're helped by these messages, if they encourage you, if they bless you, please let at least one other person know about them and and get the word out there. And let's work together to find and feed the hungry, find and give drink to the thirsty. And if you'd like to contact us here at Pathfinders, our email is pathfindersmin at gmail.com. Now, we are in a series of messages from the book of Judges called Commission to Lead. And we're seeing how the book of Judges relates to us today in many senses, but our theme is that if we would judge ourselves we would not be judges. And because of that scripture, I believe it's 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. 31, if we would judge ourselves, so God then is still raising up judges. And that would be that we each, as individuals, would judge ourselves, not other people, ourselves. And that then we would attempt to cause other people to judge themselves. What a difference there is in that from going around judging everybody and being hypocrites ourselves. First we deal with ourselves and then we try to get people to deal with their selves. That cuts us out of the judgment deal, except when it comes to ourselves. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray, Almighty God, that you will help this man today minister your word. This weak vessel, when we are weak, we find your strength. Lord, let me find your strength today and bring this message. And I pray, Lord God, that each person who hears it would be touched and that we would not explain or excuse ourselves from truth. And I ask this, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, as the devil rages in these last days and knows his time is short, hitting us with everything that he's got, Lord, let us be on the attack. Let us have the initiative and let us, Lord God, win. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Fear title of this message is Gideon. We are going to be in a two-part message, series of messages on Gideon. And this one is called Gideon, the Cycle of Fear, Part 1. Fear. What a word. What a terrible word. Especially the inner fears, insecurity, inadequacy, worry, doubt, all these inner fears that go on in our lives because of our wounded souls and because of the fall of Adam and Eve. Everybody has short bursts of of all of these emotions of insecurity, inadequacy, worry, doubt, fear. We, we, we all have these, but it's when we uh, 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 they should be time limited. It's it's when they're they're not time limited that we fall into big trouble. We fall into trouble because we fall into bondage to these things. But more importantly, we fall into trouble with God because fear is a big problem with God. It's a big sin. Look at Revelation chapter twenty one, uh, verses six through eight. He that overcometh, oh God, let us be overcomers, shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, now listen to who's listed first in this awful list, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and the liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. My goodness, fear becomes a very big problem, doesn't it? Now, we have to explain that the fearful that listed in this verse of Scripture, notice also how it was connected with the next one, the unbelieving. Fearful are not people who have fear. 
Everybody has fear. If I didn't have fear of being run over by a car, uh, I wouldn't look both ways when I cross the street and no doubt would be run over by a car. And so <clears throat> there has to be a sense of caution and a sense of fear in our lives. The fearful are those who take counsel in their fears and let their fears control their lives. When, when people are in unbelief, give in to their fears, they become slaves to worry, to doubt, to insecurity, especially about our basic needs. You see, it's unbelief that keeps us from the victory over sin bondage. And this sin, the sin of fearfulness, is allowed. The sin of unbelief is allowed. It's coddled. <laughs> Today we think that the Word of God is not sufficient. But the Word of God is sufficient for all of our fears and all of our uh, maladies and problems and sins that we face because of our flesh. So, before we go on, let me define unbelief. Unbelief is an apathy. What an awful word. An apathy about uh, and doubting of that God can and will provide for us and that God can and will set us free. No temptation has taken us that is not common to man. But God says with every temptation, he will show the way of escape. F unbelief isn't believing that. Uh, faith is believing that God is and that he's the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Unbelief would be the opposite of that. So uh, one, one good definition of faith is sub submitting our life and our future to God and truly believing we are free in Christ and then resisting the devil. Submitting everything to God and re in, in faith resisting the devil. James 4, 7 and 8 says those exact words. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Boy, double-mindedness is a big problem. We need to see that we need, if we draw nigh to God, he draws nigh to us. If we submit to God, then we can resist the devil. But we have to draw nigh to God with faith, that not just that he is, but that he's the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You see, if, if somebody walked into a church today uh, naked, may, I better say fully naked because a lot of people walk in half naked. Uh, if somebody walked in fully naked into your fellowship Sunday morning, why, they'd, they'd be in trouble. They would stand out. They, they, uh, somebody would try to put something to cover them up. But most people come into fellowship full of double-minded unbelief and are never challenged. In fact, they're coddled. They're petted. Their unbelief is coddled. Their unbelief is, is, is stroked and petted. It's so common that we, we sing with it. We, we, we make it comfortable. We even try to build with it. God help us to see that that was Israel's problem. And God help us to see that that's our problem. That's my problem. That's your problem. Why can't people get free from fear? And why can't people get free from the same old bondage? Well, it's simple. It's because of unbelief. We need to hear God. Of course, we need to hear God tell us that he loves us. And we hear that often in the churches today. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. It, it seems like we need to be reassured of love so much because we're so insecure. And that's a result of unbelief and fear. My goodness, we, uh, we, we have to tell somebody, uh, I love you. I love you. I love you. And we have to hear them back. I love you. I love you. I love you. How many times do you have to say it before the person believes it? How many times does God have to say it before we believe that God loves us and he accepts us? I think, I believe, that the, the second important emphasis and question in the New Testament is how much do we love God? I mean, we could keep singing to him over and over about how much we love him, but Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. And we love him 
because we believe that he first loved us. Real faith in the love and acceptance found in Christ is something that is powerful and transformational, which is an ever, ever growing process of sanctification and transformation in our lives. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren. This is the Holy Spirit. You know, that's Paul who wrote that, but we believe, we, we should believe that he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So who's the one that's doing the beseeching, Paul or God? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice that this is by the mercies of God. Oh, the mercy of God. Brother, sister, perhaps you've fallen. Perhaps you're not in a good place. Perhaps you haven't been in a good place for a long time. Please see that God's mercy is new every morning. And he wants to reach out to you in that mercy. And in that mercy, have you present yourself, your whole self, to him. And stop being conformed to this world. And be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By digging into his word. And letting his word become you. Oh, the mercy of God. It's still here, people, but the time is running out. Transformation, sanctification. Sometimes that changes in, in our lives are slow, and sometimes it happens really fast, uh, but it should always be going on. We must never, ever have our feet in cement, in the cement of unbelief. When a person is caught up in unbelief, they're in an ever, ever increasing state of becoming more and more bitter, more and more fearful, and more and more self-absorbed. And this double-minded unbelief and this self-absorption grows in our lives, and it produces a lack of motivation. It produces a boredom that starts to fester and grow in our lives. And this lack of motivation, this Boredom will eventually lead to a sense of entitlement. My goodness, almost everybody's there in this place of entitlement, this boring place of entitlement, this lack of discipline and this state of spiritual slothfulness. Apathetic spiritual sloth is a fertile breeding ground and a nest for a spirit of fear to get a hold of our lives. Proverbs 22.13 says, the slothful man says, there's a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. Yeah, the, slug, the sluggard, the slothful person, the slovenly person is afraid to do anything. It's the sloth that breeds that fear. And that sloth is bred by unbelief. Spiritual sloth and fear feed on one another. And a person could be diligent in every area of their life. We're talking about spiritual sloth. Somebody could be very diligent, hard-working person, very good at keeping a home and doing all the things like that. Most aren't, but someone could be that and still be in spiritual sloth. No prayer life, no study of the Word, no application of the Word of God, no engaging in the Great Commission. This lethargic condition it is a faithless, idol-infested prayerlessness that produces a vain religiosity that causes a person to just sit back and hide, sit back and hide from being and making disciples. Well, we saw it with COVID-19 and the people allowed churches to be closed. They allowed uh, nursing homes to be off limits to uh, uh, that uh, people were abandoned with no resistance was given to these decrees why fear i wondered i wondered so much why as you went in the beginning of COVID-19, oh, I never realized that there was so much fear in people's lives 
go to the grocery store and people, oh, don't come near me. Uh, where were the praise teams? Where were all these bands that play for people in the church on Sunday mornings? Mo now listen, there's exceptions, but most of these people are just up there performing. They, they want to be performers. They're, they're not leading people in worship of God. They're just performing and their music is so doggone loud, people can't even hear themselves sing. And, and where were these bands? Where were these praise teams if they loved the Lord so much? Why were they uh, gripped with fear themselves? Why weren't they in the parking lots of the grocery stores and Walmart and places where people gather with, with their instruments, pr playing praise unto God and calming the people and driving away the spirit of fear? They weren't there because they were full of fear themselves. Why were the churches closed? Because the pastors were full of fear themselves. Fearful men allowed the government to forbid families and friends and pastors to visit the sick during, in, in, that were in nursing homes. Can you imagine your mother languishing, being neglected? <laughs> They're not allowed to visit them out of fear? The one who changed your diapers and taught you how to eat Taught you how not to go potty in your pants. Taught you how to talk. Taught you how to walk. Taught you how to get dressed. Oh, my sons and pastors should have burst in and demanding to see them. I'll tell you a story. There was a man who called me on the phone during the peak of this thing. And he asked, he said he was in the hospital and asked me that I would come and visit him. And then another man on the same day, by the way, uh, wanted me to come and visit. And I'm a pastor, and so I went, first I went to a hospital here in, in my hometown called Miller Dwan. And I was met, as I walked in the door, I was met by two security guards. And one of them said, with masks on, uh, can I help you, sir? I said, well, no, I don't need any help. And then, and then they confronted me as, a, well, why are you here? I said, I'm a pastor. I have come to visit one of the people that I'm the pastor of. Well, no, you can't. And I said, oh, yes, I can. Are you aware of the Constitution of Minnesota, the Minnesota State Constitution, that anyone in any facility in the, in the state of Minnesota has a right to have a visit from their uh, doctor, their spiritual advisor and an attorney at any reasonable hour of the day. And they looked at me dumbfounded. And I said, it's a right officer. It's not a privilege. I'm not here to exercise some privilege. It's my right. And I am going to visit that person. Well, they made a phone call. And then they said, you can go up. Well, I finished that visiting that person. And I went over to the other hospital, St. Mary's Medical Center here in my hometown of Duluth. And I met at the, uh, at the walkway across into the hospital by a nurse who's sitting at a table. And she, she, by the way, those officers were polite. And so was this woman. The woman said, excuse me, sir, why are you here? I said, well, I'm here to, I'm a pastor and I'm here to visit one of the people uh, from my church. And she said, well, you're not allowed to do that. And I said, excuse me, but I am allowed to do that. And I told her also about the Constitution. And she said, well, uh, just a moment. And she made a phone call and she called up to the floor. And the people, uh, uh, then she gave me the floor and I, uh, the phone and I talked to the head nurse on the floor. And she told me the same thing, that I can't come. And I said, no, no, I can come and I'm going to come. I, I'm appealing up higher. Give me your boss. And finally I got to the, to the boss and the, and the boss said, yes, you could come. Now, here's my problem. I'm just a little guy with a little flock. And this is well into the COVID-19 thing. This is several months into it. Why was it me? And I'm not bragging about me. But why was it little me that made that stand and from that point on, any pastor who wanted to, anytime I ever went back there and I said I was a pastor, yes, you could go. It went to the top and they came down and said they probably talked to their lawyers and said, yeah, you have to let the pastors visit. Why me? Where, where were the pastors of these 2,000, 1,500 member churches? Don't they have anybody in the hospital gripped with fear? 
And did I have fear? Of course. I don't want to catch COVID-19, but some things are more important and we need to factor in the fear and do what God has called us to do. And so do you. That isn't about me. It's not about me. It's about what's right and what's wrong. A disciple is overcoming unbelief. A disciple is overcoming boredom and self-absorption. And, and, and a person who's, who's facing and resisting and defeating every fear in their life. People could go to every church activity, Bible study, concert meeting, conference, and still be filled with unbelief. They go to these conferences, and then they come back, and they talk about how they were touched by God, and their lives are changed forever. Two weeks later, they're right back in the same nonsense. Why? Unbelief. People can be in every meeting all their life and still be hiding from the world, the flesh, and the devil, never deploying. I asked a man once, very gifted and wealthy man, why aren't you active in the Great Commission? Well, he said, I don't know enough. I said, how's that possible? Haven't you been a, in the church all of your life from the, from the nursery all the way up through the senior group? He said, yes. I said, so theoretically, you've been in every meeting, every Sunday service, every, every youth group, every Sunday school class, every conference, every special speaker, all of your life. Isn't that true? He said, yes. I said, well, how's it possible that you don't know enough? His answer was, Bob, you're a scary man. He answered the question, didn't he? F-E-A-R. Wow. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of those meetings. There's nothing wrong with any of those conferences. Well, I don't, maybe there is, but let's assume there isn't. It, the problem is the individual, the, the, the fearful, prayerless spectator who has no intention to deploy because he's full of fear. Spiritual sloth puts a person on defense. And that's the worst place for anybody to be, especially a Christian. People, instead of compromising to be liked, we should focus on whether we like them or not. We need to be the peer pressure. In the history of warfare, no army has ever won on defense. And every army that ever took a defensive position was defeated. Now, that's a fact in the history of warfare. That, there's been a lot of warfare. <laughs> That should tell us something. We've got to, with diligence, wake up, rise up from self-absorption and apathy and, and, and engage the things that we fear. Where's the diligence? Where's the passion? Where's the drive? Where's the hunger? Where's the thirst? Where's the attack and conquer attitude? Overcome by double-minded unbelief and fear. If we are to overcome fear... We've got to get rid of spiritual sloth. We've got to get rid of double-minded unbelief and become single-minded people of prayer, seeking the face of God diligently. We must get filled with the Holy Spirit, and we must spontaneously and intentionally and aggressively engage in the Great Commission. If we continue in faithless, self-absorbed lethargy, lethargy, we're going to still be filled with fear and continue to hide in our delusions and remain in bondage. Now, without a doubt, the Word of God teaches that the whole cycle of fear is a spiritual problem flowing from unbelief, and that's what we're going to be looking at here in a moment in the life of Gideon. If we would, in faith, See ourselves as God sees us. We would be free. Fear and inferiority are spiritual problems, and the victory is in the Spirit of God, who can only be known spiritually. John 6, 36, excuse me, 6, 63 dyslexia. <laughs> it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. If we're abiding in Christ the way we're supposed to be, 
The Spirit of God will quicken his word, and we will see the Lord, and we will disown ourselves. We will take up the cross, and we will follow him and have victory over unbelief and and fear and victory over our bondages. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind, which means also self-discipline. Now, the story of Gideon is a perfect example of the spiritual battle with double-minded unbelief and fear and inferiority. Judges, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, And the Lord, when are we not in the sight of the Lord, by the way? And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which were in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Hiding in dens and caves and strongholds. Let's think of Midian if you will, and the enemies of Israel as the devils that are the enemies of God's church being you and me. Midian, for instance, a spirit of fear, certainly it'll appear that way. Israel, Israel, God's chosen people in double-minded unbelief had believed a lie and in idolatry went after self and the world for fulfillment. Sound familiar? And because of this, they're in bondage. Hebrews 3, uh, uh, it says, uh, 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 so you see they could not enter in because of unbelief. They were in bondage because they believed a lie. They were in fear because they did not see themselves as God's chosen people. We need to tell ourselves the truth, you know, or your emotions are always lying. We need to tell ourselves the truth from the Word of God and get that into our spirit. Uh, We are not born again to lose. We were born to lose, but we're born again to win, to conquer. We're God's chosen people, just like Israel. Think about it. God's chosen, hiding in dens and caves. This is so foolish and so ludicrous, it boggles the mind. They could have conquered any foe. All they had to do was believe and act out of faith like David and Goliath. But instead, they were hiding in dens and caves and strongholds out of fear. It's it's just like you see it so often in our in our gatherings. It's like a, a new teenager, a new adult comes to fellowship on a Sunday morning. What happens? The church kids, the adults, I'll ignore the new one. And uh, as they click up in their comfort zones of fear, instead of reaching out, just just think about this. This has happened. Someone filled with despair is on their way to put a bullet through their head. As they drive by a church, they think, I'm going to give this a chance. Greeted by an usher, ignored by everyone else who are clicked up in their comfort zone of fear, they then leave and end their life. Oh, God. So much of what is done by Christians today is nothing more less than hiding in dens and caves. Christians in fear, hiding in buildings and in pews and in programs and in events. Saints hiding in a church and trying to find their social life in Bible study after Bible study when they should be learning and going out and teaching Bible studies to others. God's chosen, called out church, yarding up like a bunch of st- starving does in the winter who end up being eaten by wolves. They turn Christianity into a social club of fearful people who never come to victory, content to celebrate addiction, calling it recovery. What a cop-out. What a cop-out of unbelief. Just think how this must 
trouble our Lord who died so that we could be in victory over others, so that he could be our Father, so that we could be temples of the Holy Spirit and ambassadors for Christ. Oh, if we would only see ourselves the way God sees us. We're not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ to be spectators. We're being entertained by a meal, a band, and then listen to a teaching, and then go away unchanged. Most today are part of an experiment that started in the late 70s. The name of the experiment was called Church Growth Strategy. Not Great Commission Strategy, not Disciple-Making Strategy, but rather Church Growth Strategy. Seminaries began to play with the concepts of how to grow the church with such things as curb appeal, programs, music, seeker sensitivity, to name just a few. Seeker sensitivity? What is that? It's making sinners comfortable in their sin, dumbing down the cross and thinking that self-love and programs will bring repentance. Always preaching about the love of God, not about how much do you love him by keeping his commandments. You see, the denominational leaders wanted rapid growth, which led to the Assemblies of God declaring the 90s as the decade of harvest. Oh, my with tremendous pressure to produce numbers. The mice were placed on the, on the treadmill. I, I would go to uh, uh, pastors' meetings, uh, monthly pastors' meetings, and, and there would be pastors who would be, can finally be convicted and say, you know, I lied on my year-end reports and up to the numbers. And I thought, why? Who are they trying to impress? Yeah like mice in a lab. People were lured to say sinners' prayers with promises of health, wealth, happiness, all these fancy dancing preachers coming along. Oh, boy. Used car salesmen. Now, if you're a used car salesman and you're honest, God bless you. Most aren't, and neither were these fancy dancers. Things like sin, lordship, The cross, repentance, holiness, righteousness, victory over sin, and the fear of the Lord were done away with and replaced with curb appeal, self-esteem, coping psychology, music, soft preachers, coffee bars, and anything that would attract a crowd. Brothers and sisters, when music and the arts become more important than the preaching of the cross, the people have already lost sight of the composer and the designer. A lot of the bigger churches today have a pastor of the arts. What? The first time I saw that, I just said, what? (laughs) That's not there. God gave apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Got nothing to do, nothing to do with the arts. The gospel became centered on the individual instead of on Christ. And Christ became a personal savior, like some kind of a personal toothbrush that we use to brush ourselves up and throw back on the rack. The emphasis became knowing self and feeling God instead of disowning self and knowing God. And most victims of this experiment have lost all courage, remain in fear of man, and have no victory over anything. And statistics prove that most who professed Christ during this time of quick-trip Christianity have fallen away. The back door of the church is bigger than the front. People move from church to church in search of something that's missing. And what's missing? Christ. (laughs) Real faith in Christ. Real fear of God. And real fullness of the Holy Spirit that will drive out the fear of man. This kind of evangelism produced birth defects. Deformed babies. And this churchianity, driven by unbelief with all the repetitive music, releases a dopamine that's addictive, people. It's an addiction. It's an addiction. 
And because of this unbelief and trusting in the methods of man, the ways of God uh, for growth have been put aside. And so what happens? People are hiding in dens and caves and the strongholds of comfort zones. 80% of the men who should be God's warriors have become treasonous, apostate, fearful, addicted to pornography on the internet. And the single young people fornicate with impunity because they have believed in a false Christ and are part of a false Christianity and they idolize these, these uh, star uh, the girls, they idolize the, the star uh, Christian vocalists who are fornicators. And they, they worship the, the men, uh, Christ, so-called Christian performers, who are fornicators. And so they are fornicators. We're supposed to worship God. He ain't a fornicator. What you catch people is what you have to keep them with. If girls catch boys with lust, they cannot expect them to continue to love them uh, five years, two kids, and 50 pounds later. Oh, no, they'll have to keep them with what they caught them with, and they ain't going to be able to, and that's why there's so much divorce. One reason. Same is true of people in the church. If we catch them with marketing schemes, and fancy dancing sermons, then they're never going to come to the fear of God, and their, their faith isn't going to be in Christ. It's going to be in Santa Claus. How did this happen? Remember, because of unbelief, Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and turned, was turned over to Midian. It was unbelief. So what happens? Unbelief takes root in the church. And then what happens? The, the false pillow prophets come in along with all the psychological ways of man. Then the, well, see, the psychological ways of man aren't the cross. <laughs> then the culture and the peer pressure of the culture advances in the church instead of the church being the peer pressure and advancing into the culture. God help us to find and welcome the true prophets and break free from this lie of the devil. So let's go on and see what happens in Judges chapter 6, 3 through 6. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and they destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come to Gaza and left no substance for Israel neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, from both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And brother and sister, we've got many people who are greatly impoverished because of the spirit of fear driven by unbelief in the church today. They came up with their cattle and their camels. I'm told that this is the first time that camels were ever used in warfare by the Midianites. But here's us. The word is sown in our hearts. The crop is planted. But the devil comes and steals. The truth destroys the crop and holds us in bondage to a lie. And then we hide in dens and caves and strongholds. Most can't even remember what the Lord said uh, uh, in the sermon on Sunday. Why? Why? There's a pastor. I never met the man, but my friend knows him. And this pastor said to my friend, this pastor spends 40 hours a week in preparation for his Sunday message. What a man of God. And he said to my friend, do you... Can you have any understanding at all of how discouraging it is to spend 40 hours a week praying, seeking God, studying his word, and hearing from God to prepare my message and to know fully well that most people have forgotten it by the time they get to the door? The word is sown. And we're told in Matthew 4, 13 through 20, the farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word. And 
Others are like seed uh, sown on rocky places. They hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last for a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still, others, like seed sown among thorns, they hear the word and the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desire for other things comes in and chokes the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. You're one of those. We're always one of those. There's no other reason for defeat in our lives. Mostly the cares of the word, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust for other things. You see, Satan is after the word in our lives, just like he was after the crop in Israel's life. And he kept them without the crop. And if Satan could keep us without the word in our hearts, he's got everything else. And we're impoverished. Why? Because we've got to apply the word to our lives. It's not enough to come and hear. We don't, we don't know something until we're doing it. Most refuse to be true disciples of the Lord in an abiding friendship, oneness, and fellowship led by faith in a closet of prayer every day, an undistracted place where they see him and they're undone and they see themselves as justified and accepted and get equipped in him. Midian employed a scorch earth policy. Each time the crop was sown, they came up and destroyed the crop and held them in bondage. It's the same for you and me. That's exactly what the devil is doing. The word is sown. He's doing everything he can, just like Midian. He's coming and trying to destroy the crop. And most people sit back and let him do it. We can't be victorious if we're in fear. We can only be a victim. But Israel came to their senses and cried out to the Lord to deliver them. And, oh, God, that's what we need to do today. Judges 6, 7 through 10, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, Oh, God, cause us to cry out to you because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt, I brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians. That's true of all of us. And I, 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 brought, I, I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you. And I drove them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. We have not obeyed his voice in this country. If only Israel would have cried out in the wilderness for faith instead of the things of the flesh. I remember a message I heard years ago by David Wilkerson. The title of it was Right Song, Wrong Side. And he talked about how when they crossed over, that they got out the tambourines and they began to sing, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider thrown into the seed. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song, hath now become my victory. He said, Right Song! Wrong side. If they'd have sang it on the other side, as the Egyptian chariots were coming storming down on them and there was no sea that parted before them, if they would have sang that song, then the sea would have parted and they would have walked out in faith. They were responding to the miracle. The faith needs to happen before the miracle. If we're going to ever have victory, we must see God as he is and we must see God, uh, ourselves the way God sees us. What are most people's prayers about? The comfort of the world, not the kingdom of God. Why? Because we've not seen the Lord and we're full of unbelief. The prayer should be, oh God, deliver me from unbelief and give me faith. Not increase my faith, but give me some. 
over and over, God has delivered these people from bondage when they cried out to him. This is this this time he, he didn't just raise up a judge. He he's gonna raise up Gideon, but before he raises up Gideon, he sends a prophet to call them to repentance. Sometimes crying out isn't enough after repeated sin. We've got to have a prophet expose our hearts and call us to repentance. Not going to some theophostic false prophet fortune teller. If you don't know what theophostic prayer is, it's, it's Freudian psychology in the name of Christianity. Digging into people's pasts, thinking that digging into the past is going to bring healing into their lives. But I want to ask you a really important question. If I get an infection or you get an infection, do I need to know why I got it in order to be cured? I get the, I get the antibiotic and I get cured. It's not necessary to know how I got it. Well, I suppose it could prevent me from getting it again, but that's not necessary to be healed. And the same is true of us. We don't need to dig into our past and go through all the hurts and stuff that we've had in our past. Just bring our hearts to God and believe in God and let him heal our broken hearts. Set us free from all the bruises and the opening of prison to all of our bondage. It's faith in Christ that does that. He's the antibiotic. What prevents us from seeking God that way? Double-minded, self-absorbed unbelief, which produces idolatry. Jesus said it in Luke 14, verses 26 and 27 and verse 33. If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and brethren and sisters, and yes, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whoso doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So likewise, whoso doth not forsake all that he hath cannot be my disciple. But we love ourselves. We love our family. We love our stuff, our sports, our sin more than we love him. That's idolatry. Jesus asked Peter and the boys on the beaches, I'm sure he was pointing at the fish, do you love me more than these? Do you love him more than these? So God in his love for his people has sent a prophet. And I hope that he sent one here today, the pro pro prophetic preaching of the word. I'm not calling myself a prophet. The word is the prophet. Let us see what God's going to do to deliver them from inferiority. Judges 6, 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah that pertaineth unto Joas the Abyssalite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites, God's chosen people, hiding down in a wine press. Have you ever threshed grain? I have. I've been ricing with the Native Americans when I was ministering among them. And uh, you have to get out in the open and you have to throw the grain up in the air and let the wind take the chaff away. <laughs> Instead of threshing the grain out in the open on the top of the hill in the wind, we have Gideon, one of God's chosen people, hiding in a wine press, like so many hiding in a pew. He was down in a hole like a coward, trying to do something that could only be done in the open wind. And so the question is, does the devil have you hiding in the fear of life? The word is our grain. And we must not be hiding in our fear or the word will not go forth. There are people in this world that will not hear the word of God unless they hear it from you. We must get up into the wind with our grain, which is the word of God and the making of disciples, or we will implode with grumbling and complaining. So let's see what he says to you and me. Judges 6, 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. What? <laughs> the first time I 
when I first started studying this, <laughs> I, I said to God, God, why are you mocking him? Or does it seem to be like you to mock him? And I, I sensed the Lord say to me, Bob, I'm not mocking him. That's how I see him. He's a coward because he doesn't see himself the way I see him. He's a coward because of his unbelief. He called him a mighty man of valor. And he said, the Lord is with thee. The Lord is with thee? Huh. Remember those words. I think he said that in the Great Commission. So God wasn't trying to mock him. This was God's reality. This is the way God saw Gideon. If he would just believe that, and, and if we would just believe that, that, we would enter into our destiny in life instead of letting fear keep us from it. Most never get to their destiny. I've, I've read that only 5% ever become what they were formed to be. Why? Double-minded unbelief and the fear. If only we would cry out in faith and begin to come what God has intended us to be. We must see ourselves through God's eyes. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. We've got to see that we're God's chosen people. In him, we're mighty sons of God. Unbelief is believing a lie. God said that he would never forsake us. I will be with you unto the end of the age. So Gideon now shows his unbelief, shows his inferiority, and the question is, how much do you have and how much do I have? Judges 6.13, and Gideon said unto him, oh my, let, let me do this different. Listen to this man whine. Have you ever found yourself whining in your prayer time? And Gideon said unto him, Oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then has all this befallen us? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us. Delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Unbelief dripping with it. Just dripping with it. And the Lord didn't forsake them. They forsook him. And he put them into the hands of the Midianites because he didn't forsake them. And he wanted to get them to come back to him. We should never talk to God like this. It's just dripping with unbelief. We should never ask God why. We should, that's challenging God's authority. We should ask, what can I become? And how can I bring glory to your name in this trial? They forsook God. They forsook the truth and were in bondage to Midian, or if you will, the spirit of fear and our bondages for the same reasons. It's unbelief that causes us for, to forsake God in some way. But God, who is rich in mercy, never forgets. He wants us to be free. Judges 6, 14. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? Sound familiar? Oh, Christian, we're sons of God, ambassadors of Christ, temples of the Holy Spirit. And he says the exact same thing to us in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth hath been given me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. Surely I am with you. Always on even unto the end of the age. Same thing. Go in this thy might. Am I not with thee? But oh no, we hide in fear. We, like Gideon, have got to see that God is with us and that he understands us. We are his children, his chosen children, and with him in us, we must go into the world and embrace what he's calling us to do. We've got to forsake all the things that hold us back, especially fear. Jesus understands this problem of fear quite well. He understands the need to thresh our grain quite well out in the open 
Matthew 26, 36 through 39. Then cometh Jesus unto them to a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go yonder and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it be possible that this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but as thou wilt. What cup? All the suffering of the cross? Well, yeah, that, but lots of people have experienced physical suffering uh, for, for, for the gospel. Uh, should the captain of our faith cry out like that because he's afraid of it? Oh, no, it was the fact that he knew that he was going to become sin. The holy pure, sinless Son of God was going to become sin and his Father was going to turn from him and he said, let this cup pass from me if it's possible. Not my will, but thine. And most Christians today are yet in the Garden of Gethsemane crying out, is there not some other way to get back to the Garden of Righteousness, Peace and Joy? They cry out, do I have to disown myself? Do I have to take up the cross? Do I have to forsake all the things that are hindering me? And most are told that they don't by pastors who have not. Christ was tempted in every way. In fact, Gethsemane means oil press. To have victory, we've got to have a problem. To have a testimony, we've got to have a test. To be a victor, we've got to be victimized. And courage is not the absence of fear, but rather factoring it in and doing what's right in spite of it. Jesus was able to have victory because in faith he saw himself the way the Father saw him. Thus he got up from the press and he went to the top of the hill and threshed his grain. John 18, 4 and 5. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, What seek ye? Whom, excuse me, whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, I am he. I am he. I'm the one you want. Let's get on with this. And so let me ask you this. Because of all the hurts in life, does the devil have you hiding like Gideon in a wine press in fear? Are you like the Israelites hiding in dens and caves and strongholds and comfort zones, church pews and church programs? Nothing wrong with the program or the pew. Hiding there is the problem. I want my tombstone to read he died living. What about you? Are you living the Christian life to the fullest? We must go forth in boldness and courage with our heads held high, looking life in the eye. He has sent us. He is with us. There's an old song, secular song, that speaks to this. I'd like to share the words with you. I hope you never fear the mountains in the distance. Never settle for the path of least resistance. Living might mean taking chances, but they're worth taking. Loving might be a mistake, but it's worth making. Don't let some hell-bent heart leave you bitter. When you come close to selling out, reconsider. Give the heavens above more than just a passing glance, and when you get the choice to sit it out or dance, I hope you dance. What a great word, <laughs> It's not talking about dancing. It's talking about living and loving again. It's not the love that hurts people. Love can, They say love hurts. That's impossible. Love cannot hurt. It's the betrayal that hurts. Truth can't hurt. It's the deception that hurts. And it takes Christ, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, to make us vulnerable to love again. And I'm not talking about being romantically in love talking about loving people enough to share the gospel with them. You're going to get betrayed. You're going to get hurt. Be vulnerable. 
Open your heart to love again. Another song says this, the soul afraid of dying never learns to live. The heart afraid of breaking never learns to dance. So let's dance. Let's get rid of the unbelief in our lives. And let's see ourselves the way God sees us. We'll pick up with Gideon next time. Heavenly Father, I, I pray for every person who listens to this and for the man that just shared it, that, Lord God, you would change our hearts and that we would embrace you like never before, that we would indeed disown ourselves, take up our cross and follow you, that we would indeed get emboldened with your Holy Spirit and go and sow our grain out in the open. I pray this, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Until next time. God bless you.